All right, there we go. <laughs> Here we are. Okay. This is Dr. Z, everybody. I'm going to let her introduce herself and um, give you her background. She's been with us in the past, and we just love her so much that we <laughs> invite her back. And um, uh, there is a, I know I sent out a content um, uh, disclosure. Um, she's going to be talking about uh, swords and stuff. Um, uh, what was it, Damascus Steel? Yeah, it's Damascus Steel. It'll be a very, very brief part of the presentation. So I will I will give everyone a heads up before I talk about that. So if you want to sort of walk away from the computer for a minute or you know a few minutes, then yeah. Yeah, we'll let you know in the chat that you can come back or she'll just let us know. Um, yeah. But she'll be, they'll be muted, so, so I'll just do the mm -hmm. chat. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. All right, there you go. All right, perfect. Well, let me get my little laser pointer set up. All right, so again, thank you, Adrian, and thank you all for having me again. I'm super excited to be here and, just, and to talk to you all. Uh, so for those of you who haven't met me yet or didn't hear the presentation that I gave back in May, uh, my name is Stephanie Zaleski. You can also call me Dr. Z. Um, and so today what I'm going to tell you about, first I'm going to talk to you a little bit about sort of what my background is and where I went to school uh, and sort of where some of my interests are. Uh, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit about nanoscience. So first we'll talk about sort of what nanoscience is, what nano actually means, and then we'll actually get into what does it have to do with art? Because maybe you're thinking, oh, nanotechnology sounds like the future, but it turns out that there's actually nanoscience in very old things that we figured out recently. All right, so for those of you who have already been with me, this may be a little bit of a repeat, so just bear with me. Uh, I apologize, uh, but I wanted to just give a little bit of introduction about where I'm from and who I am uh, and sort of, you know, my just my background. So you get to know me a little bit better. The person behind the screen, right? All these Zoom meetings. So I'm originally from New York. Uh, so I believe you are all sort of in California in the Los Angeles metro area. Yeah, so somebody asked if I help preserve and study art and I do. And so we're gonna talk all about that today. So we're gonna talk about how art and nano are related to each other. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the stuff we do in my research. So I grew up in New outside of New York City uh, when I was, you know, when I was your age, I loved drawing. I also loved science. So I either wanted to be a cartoonist, I wanted to draw cartoons, or I wanted to maybe be a scientist. I, I mostly wanted to be, be an artist. Uh, and things I like to do when I'm not working in my lab, I like I have a dog, so I like to hang out with my dog. I like to cook. I love being in the kitchen. It's kind of like doing chemistry, but in the kitchen and you get to eat it. Uh, I like to do knitting and crafting, and I also like listening to music. So I love different, different all different types of music. Uh, and as far as art goes, I really like what's called surrealism. Uh, so kind of very like futuristic, kind of like dreamy types of paintings. Uh, and I also really like anything, really any kind of like art or design that has really like bright and bold colors and patterns. So I was like really wearing really col colorful things, makes things nice and exciting. So I, this is a picture of me when I was in college. So this is about a little over 10 or so years ago. Uh, but when I graduated from high school, I decided that I wanted to go to college in New York City. And so I went to Barnard College, which is a, an all women's college. I studied biochemistry. Uh, I, and I also took lots of art history classes. So I took all different types of classes. I didn't just take my chemistry classes. I took art history classes. I took literature classes. I tried to learn how to speak Italian at one point and that went okay. Uh, but yeah, I took lots of different things. I love, you know, I love learning about new things. And so it was a really fun place to be, especially, you know, being in the city. When I was in college, I did an internship. So I actually, once or twice a week, I went to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which is a really, really big museum. Um, and they have a department of scientific research. So they actually have scientists on staff that help analyze and study and preserve works of art. And so I worked on studying different types of like binding media. So when we say that it's kind of like the glue of a painting. So like when you paint, 
the paint is sort of like a very smooth thing. It has a pigment, which colors it. And then it has a binder, which is what holds it all together. I got to learn how to use lasers, which was super exciting. And I still do that in my work. So I guess it was, you know, it worked uh, trying to reel me into doing science. Getting to play with lasers was a big fun part of that. Uh, and I got to actually study, uh, you know, samples from real works of art, which is very cool, especially as somebody who, you know, I was only in college at the time. So it was really a privilege to, to be able to do that. And so then I, you know, I moved on. I, I got my PhD in chemistry. I moved to Chicago from New York. This is me and my, my PhD graduation robes. I was very excited. It was a very happy, exciting day when I graduated. I finished my degree. And then I, I went, you know, I kind of hopped for a few years. So I studied, I went back to the Met. I went back to New York. I studied Japanese woodblock prints. So maybe some of you are familiar or have seen this, this, uh, this piece before, the wave. So I actually got to study sort of the pigments that were used to make these, these types of works of art. And so here you can see me like shining a little light on the, the object to actually analyze it and to try to figure out what the artist used to make it. I also studied things on glass. Uh, so some photographs on glass. So before we had cell phone cameras, before we had digital cameras, uh, people would actually develop photographs on pieces of glass. Um, and so you can see sort of the negative image here. So it's like the opposite image here. And so we, we studied what the glass was made out of that these artists were using during the time. And then I also was at, before my current job, I was at Northwestern University, which is in Chicago. So I went back to where I did my PhD and I studied, I studied paintings like Van Gogh paintings. And I studied sort of some of the degradation products. So sometimes over time, a work of art can start to degrade or decay. And we wanna try to figure out how it did that so that we can take care of it so that we can have it last for a very long time. All right, and so now I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area. I'm a, I'm a professor of chemistry. Uh, so now what I do, I mostly teach. Uh, so I like to, I teach all different types of chemistry classes. I teach general chemistry. I teach people about how to use different types of chemistry instruments. So like how we actually do measurements. Um, and I'm doing some research with the fine arts museums of San Francisco. So maybe some of you might be familiar with like the Getty Museum. They also have scientists as well. All right, and so now we're sort of going to dive into the real, the real stuff of this presentation, and we're going to talk all about nano, nanoscience and nanotechnology before. So what I want you to do is to either you can type into the chat or like give me a little thumbs up. Have you ever heard the term nanotechnology or nanoscience before? Maybe some of you have. Maybe a teacher told you about it. Maybe you saw like watched a video on YouTube about it. But have you actually, yeah, so it, it seems like, you know, a few of you have heard about nanotechnology before. Awesome. Great. Yeah, because that's what we're going to be talking about today. But we're going to kind of come from it from like an art and a history perspective, rather than sort of looking at the future. All right, great. So for those of you who have heard about it, or even those of you who hadn't before, what do you think like nanotechnology or like nanoscience means? Like, what does that mean to you if you were here? that term and go ahead and type in the chat. You know, it can mean anything to you. I'm just curious to see who, you know, who's heard this term before and, you know, what do you, what do you think about when you, when you hear nanotechnology or nanoscience? Yeah. Okay, cool. I'll wait for you all to, to type a few more responses. I was gonna ask you if you if you were able to see them. Yeah, yeah. I got the I had I have two monitors. So oh, I've got the perfect. chat. I've got the chat open on one and I've got my presentation open on another. Really? So yeah. Uh-huh. You've been down this road before. Great. Yeah, it's I I teach I teach classes on Zoom still. So I've I'm a pro. I've got it all set up, you know. <laughs> totally. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So I see, let's see studying something on a really minuscule level. Yeah, nano is really small. So I'd assume that it relates to studying to really small things. Yeah, absolutely. You know, when I think, 
I think of those things, of course, but when I sort of hear those things, like, you know, in the media and the news, I think about like very advanced technology, you know what I mean? Like nano is at the very, like the frontier of, of technology and all that, you know, we're trying to develop these brand new things on this really small scale. So I think when we think of nano, we think of things that are really modern, right? We think of, you know, brand new technologies, these really tiny things. But what I want to, I'm going to talk to you about today is that nano has actually been around for longer than people actually thought. All right. And so those of you who said that, you know, nano has to do with stuff that's really small, you are absolutely correct. And so when we're talking about nanomaterials, nanotechnology, nano, whatever, really, really tiny things. Yeah, yeah, someone said the study of microscopic particles. Nano is even smaller than micro. So if we were to think about like a meter, so, you know, kind of like a certain amount of length, a meter is pretty long. There are a billion nanometers in a meter. That's a lot of nanometers. So this is really, really tiny. And here's sort of an idea of like the, the size of things and how many nanometers would actually be in this. So let's take a look at, at a hair, a single hair. One piece of hair is about 50,000 to 100,000 nanometers wide. So many, 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 many nanometers. A piece of paper that you would write your homework on, draw a picture on, has, is 75,000 nanometers thick. Uh, this, you know, a head of a pin or a nail that has a million nanometers wide. So when we're talking about things, we're talking about, you know, we're talking about molecules, we're talking about atoms, we're talking about DNA. So a, a single strand of DNA, you know, it's our genetic material, it's about two and a half nanometers wide. So when we're talking about nanotechnology, we're talking about really, really, really small things, which is probably why people think, oh yeah, this is like super advanced, right? You need lots of really fancy tools in order to actually be able to, you know, do, do nano things, do nano science, make nanomaterials. And again, what I want to talk to you about today is that people have actually been making nanomaterials for a very long time, even though they may not have actually known that they were actually doing that. So what we're going to do is I'm going to walk you through a few different examples of what I like to call sort of ancient nanotechnology. So what we have here that I have on this thing, we're going to look at a little video. This thing is very cool. This is a glass cup. Um, so like you would drink water out of it, something like that. This is from ancient Rome. So which, you know, it's modern day Italy. And this is from four, the year 400. So this is almost six, 1,600 years ago. So this is a long time ago. Didn't have lots of fancy technology that we have today. So let's just let me know if you can't see the video. So, so what we're gonna look at right now is we're gonna look at how light is shining on the cup. So it went from light going from the inside to the out and then light being shine on the cup from the outside. So what do you notice is happening when we shine light in different ways on this cup? So again, watch that video. So this is again, how we're, we're going light from the outside, light in the inside, and then light on the outside again. What's going on here? What do you see? All right. So what happened? What, what do we see with the cup? sort of scroll on a few different, you know, a few different things. So go ahead and type in the chat. What do you see? What happens when we shine it, the light at different angles in different places on this, on this cup? It's almost magical to me the way that it, what, what's going on here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, depending on the angle of the light, depending on where the light is coming from, there's like, it's like this reddish color, but then sometimes the, it looks sort of green, 
the glass looks kind of green, right? Yeah, so this glow, it, it sort of changes based off of where the light is coming from. Yeah, the colors are changing. It goes from red to brown, red to greenish color. Yeah, so there's some kind of color change going on here. Okay, so here's a photograph. So this sort of will help us. We're gonna start to try to figure out what's going on here with, of course, scientific tools, right? So this is our cup. This is the same cup. It's just a picture in different, different orientations. So in our first one, where it sort of appears this sort of brownish, greenish color, right? This is when we hit, when we have light and it's being shine on the outside of the cup. So you can kind of think about light bouncing off the surface of the cup from the outside. Then imagine, say you took like a flashlight and you dropped it on the inside of the cup. What you are seeing in this case is the light coming from the inside of the cup going to the outside of the cup. So like if we were to draw an arrow of like the direction of the light, how it's going, we call this, we call this transmitted light. So it's transmitting through the glass as opposed to this case, which is called reflected light. So reflected means it's, it's like a mirror, right? It's like it's bouncing off. The light is bouncing off of the surface instead of going through the surface here. So you might be asking yourself, and many people have asked this for many different years, right? Well, what's going on here? What, what is, it's just glass, right? It shouldn't do this. Glass doesn't do this. You know, I have my water cup right here. It's just clear. It doesn't glow colors when I shine a light on the inside of it. I wish it did, but it doesn't. So what's up? What's going on here? So we're going to take a, we're going to take a look at this. It turns out, so scientists were allowed to take a little tiny chip from one of the areas on the cup. And maybe it already had a chip. So if we take a little tiny microscopic piece of our glass, nobody's gonna notice. It's not a big deal, it's okay. We can take samples sometimes from works of art, as long as we don't take too many samples, yeah? So what scientists did is they took that little chip from the cup and then they used a, what's called an electron microscope. So what an electron microscope does is it lets us see really, 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 really tiny things. A normal microscope, we can only see so small, but with this fancy research electron microscope, scientists can see nanoparticles. So this little bar here that you see, that is 50 nanometers. So that's telling me that that length, this, the length of this line is 50 nanometers. So this that you see here, this is a nanoparticle. It is about, you know, a little over 50 nanometers in diameter. So it turns out that these nanoparticles are the things that are actually giving the cup its really special light properties. And we call these optical properties. So the way that we, you know, the way that we see things is related to optics, optical properties or light properties. Again, it's really, really quite stunning, I think, really magical. But the nanoparticles are what are doing this, these nanoparticles. So the, the researchers found that these nanoparticles are made out of gold and silver. But the way that we normally see gold and silver, right? Like if I, you know, we're thinking about like gold and silver jewelry, it's, it's yellow and it's silver. It doesn't look like this. It doesn't look green. It doesn't look red. So what's actually going on is that nanoparticles interact with light at a very different way when they're very, very small. And so nanoparticles can do what's called scattering. So they can reflect certain colors of light depending on their size. And so this is why when we reflect the light, the nanoparticles can actually sort of act like a mirror and like bounce off that light, which is why it's going to appear green. So they do that thing. And then what they can also do is they can actually also absorb light so they can both scatter and absorb light. So they can bounce off light, but they can also take in light, which is why in the transmitted version that the glass appears red. So what this is telling us, this is the oldest known object that has nanoparticles in it. So the Romans, you know, back in the day, thousands of years, you know, about a thousand, two thousand years ago, were already making nanoparticles. So our, you know, cutting edge nanotechnology 
may not be as new as we thought it originally was, which is why I like to call this ancient, ancient nano. All right, so this is our first object that we're gonna look at, our first piece of art that we're gonna talk about. The next piece of art is uh, this Damascus steel. It is a sword. Um, so in the next two slides, I have a picture of a sword. Um, so if that is something that maybe you don't wanna see or maybe upsetting to you, uh, you can go ahead and you know just close the presentation for a little bit. Um, and then I will let you know when I am done talking about it, um, when it is no longer on the screen, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and move on to my next slide. And so that slide has, again, it has a picture of a sword on it. So if you don't wanna take a look, just look away. I don't know, you know, do your homework or something like that, close the screen, but I'm gonna carry on now. All right, so now we're gonna talk about a new material and we're still sort of talking about ancient here. So this was Damascus steel, was a type of steel that was created by Muslim cultures in the Middle Ages. And so when Europeans first started to sort of have contact with Muslim nations, um, specifically during the Crusades, I don't know if you've learned about that during history, if you haven't looked it up. But anyway, the Europeans were amazed because they had these, these you know, the steel, this material that was both really strong, like really good, but also really flexible. And the way that you make steel is based out of like iron and carbon materials, which are typically very brittle and they're very weak, but somehow, you know, these different Muslim cultures realized they were able to sort of work with the materials and treat them with heat in order to get, you know, again, a really strong and a really flexible material out of something that is normally very brittle and very weak. And if you actually look at the surface, so this is about a one centimeter scale. So this is like, if you were to take, you know, either like a magnifying glass or like a microscope, you could even see it with your eyes. That steel, this type of steel has like this really funny looking pattern, right? It looks really, and it's really shiny. Um, if you look at it under, under a, a, you know, a bright light. And it almost looks like, you know, to me, it almost looks like, like tree roots or something like that. Like if you were to, you know, slice a tree, it looks like the inside of a tree. And so for the longest time, you know, people just didn't know what, what this material, like, what is the mystery? There's a mystery here. What is the sort of secret to me, the reason why this, you know, this steel has such like amazing physical properties, why it's so strong, why it's so flexible. How do, how, do they, how do they do that? And so it turns out that, so again, we have our, our image of our, our, our Damascus steel here of this really cool patterns. And so again, researchers used, they took you know, a little piece, a little sliver from, the, from a sword in a museum and they used that electron microscope. So you know, again, we're looking at, we're looking at really tiny things, we're looking at really small things at nano, looking at that nano scale, remember one billion nanometers or in a meter. And so what the researchers realized was that what was actually giving such, one of the things that was giving the steel such strength and flexibility were carbon nanotubes. And so carbon nanotubes are a, a nanomaterial. So again, on that really, really small scale, like similar to DNA, but all of these are just carbons linked together and then you have it in that tube shape. And so you can kind of think about it and almost, you know, you think about it like pasta almost. You can have really straight pasta, carbon nanotube pasta, or you can have something that's more sort of like rubbery, like a, like a very floppy noodle. So both of these pictures that you see here, so we've got about, this length is about 10 nanometers, and this length is about 15 nanometers. This is all carbon nanotube material. So actually what you see here, these like these sort of fringes that you can see, the like black and white, is actually individual tubes. So each little fringe that you see is like an individual carbon nanotube. So you know you kind of think about it as like just lining them up one by one. 
And yeah, and so the so the researchers figured out like, oh, the reason why this material is so amazing is because of nanomaterials. That's so cool. But this, you know, these things were made hundreds of years ago that the 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 people, the makers of these types of things, they weren't, you know, they didn't know they were making carbon nanotubes, but they knew that whatever they were making had really really good properties, physical properties for what they had wanted to use it for. All right. So we're done talking about swords. No more swords. We're on to the next thing. So for those of you who stepped away, feel free to come on back. We are done. We're on to our next thing. The last example that I want to give of sort of nano to ancient, it's not really ancient. We're in the 19th century now. So we're in the late 1800s. So this is about, you know, 100, a little over 100 years ago, 150. So as some of you may or may not know, that we didn't always have photography. Photography is actually a relatively recent invention in terms of human history. And you know, it's really changed the way that we like we think about things, that we see things, that we remember, because we have photographs. Um, and so when photography was first being developed in the late 1800s, what people were trying to do is to figure out how to actually like have materials that have a memory. So how are we actually able to take a picture? Um, and so there was a French scientist, his name, his last name was Daguerre. And so he created this process where you take a metal, like a copper plate. So, you know, like a penny, it's like this, this penny is copper and zinc. But imagine having like a really, really thin sheet of copper material. So it's like the same color as a penny. And then he would treat it with silver. And so the way that he treated it with the silver is that it would actually react if it was exposed to light. Um, and so you would have this really dark box and you would take the picture and you would expose the plate, your photographic plate to the light. And as a result, you would get a photograph. And you know, this, this is pretty amazing. You know, this was, you know, just to put it into context, this was made in the 1800s. This is not a modern, a modern photograph, but it looks, it has so much detail. You can see the folds on the dress. You can see all of the facial features, the clothes. You really have a lot of detail. And so again, we can take that electron microscope so we can look really, really close at what's going on in the surface. So what do you notice? So we have a dark area that has these particles. These are all on the same scale. So these are relative size, you can compare these. We have sort of like a medium white area, a bright white area, and a dark area. What do you notice between these three pictures based on these three areas? We have a bright area, which is this picture. We have like a medium area, which is this picture. And then we have a dark area, which is this picture here. What do you notice? What do you notice about the size of these, these things, these features? Are some bigger or some smaller? You know, what what's what are the bit what are the differences? You know, in my dark area, I have one thing, in my bright area, I have another thing. What do you notice? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So based on the area, right? The the these like little these particles are are slightly different. Yeah. 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 So fun fact. This is so someone said the paint might be made out of different substances. This is actually all the same thing. This is all silver. Yeah, the darker areas are bigger. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other any other thoughts? Any other observations? All right. Great. Yeah. There's darker spots. There's lighter spots. Yeah. Some of them they look they're a little bit. These are kind of bright. These are kind of dark. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. 
Yeah, the big ones do look kind of flaky, don't they? They got kind of a funny different structure. Yeah, I agree. I absolutely agree. Okay, great. So the, the thing that's going on here, so again, remember, this is a copper plate that has silver on it. And so when the silver is reacts with light, so, you know, this is a photograph, right? So this person was probably wearing a, a bright white shirt and had somewhat light skin and was wearing a dark colored dress. So the more light there is, the more interaction the silver on the surface that is sensitive to light is gonna have with the, the surface. And so what you see here, these are silver nanoparticles. So the more exposure to light an area has, the more formation of these small silver nanoparticles you're going to have. And so, you know, we can see there's a really clear difference here between the like bright white area, which has lots of particles. So, you know, think about the cup, the cup that we just talked about earlier, right? Lots of reflection, lots of, think of it as a mirror. You know, you have these tiny little reflective mirrors. So that's going to be really bright. And then this is not so bright, right? Because it's not, it's a little bit darker. And so you can see that there are less particles. They're similar in size. If you were to sort of compare how big they are, they're similar in size, but there just aren't that many. And so this area is not going to be nearly as reflective as this, this bright white area here. And then we look down at the dark area of the dress and we can see that there's just like, there really aren't any tiny little particles. We have these big sort of flaky spaced out looking particles, right? These are not, there's not going to be as much reflection of light. And the reason why is because there wasn't a lot of light here. So the silver didn't react and form these tiny little nanoparticles. So what I find really amazing about this is like these, these photographers who were developing, you know, the very first types of photography were doing very advanced nanotechnology, like nanomaterial methods, and they didn't even know it. So we look at these things, you know, a hundred or so years later, and we find, you know, how sensitive and how amazing the work that, that, that we did was. And I think that some of these are really, you know, inspiring examples of like how we can look to history to be inspired to create new things for the future. And so the last thing I'm gonna talk about is a little bit how we use, how now in the present day, how we use research, nanoscience research in my lab to study art. So rather than studying art and looking at nanoscience in art, we're applying nanoscience to learn more things about art. And the way that we do that, the thing that we care about in my, in my research is that we're studying a, a molecule's fingerprint. So we all have, if you look on your fingers, we all, you know, we have a unique fingerprint. Maybe some people don't have fingerprints and that's okay. Uh, but, you know, many people have a very unique fingerprint. Your fingerprint is your own. In the same light, molecules, so these are, this is a molecule, molecules also have a fingerprint. And their fingerprint is when we shine them with light. And if it's the right kind of light, they actually do a little dance. So a molecule has a fingerprint, which you can sort of think of as its own unique little dance. And every molecule has its own unique dance. And so if we take a molecule and we take those, all those nanoparticles that we were just talking about earlier, and we shine it with a laser light, we can actually uh, amplify that dance. So maybe the dance is really weak. Maybe it's really quiet. We can use nanoscience, we can use these nanomaterials in order to amplify it. We can turn up the volume on that molecule fingerprint. And that means that we can, you know, we can identify really, really, really small amounts of material, which is great when we're working with works of art, right? Because we don't have a lot to work with. Maybe I have one piece of fiber or I have one little pigment particle and I can't get any more. So I want something that's really sensitive, that's gonna give me a lot of information uh, with, so, which, with not that much material. Okay, so I'm gonna give you an example of how we actually use this molecule fingerprinting, this nanoscience molecule technique in order to look at art. So this is a watercolor painting 
Uh, so it's on paper with watercolors by an American artist, uh, Winslow Homer. And so it's sort of known that this was originally a very sort of vibrant scene. Like, you know, imagine looking at the sky and seeing a sunset. You see like these really sort of sometimes like bright yellows and pinks and purples. It's like, it's very beautiful. This is kind of, you know, it's kind of blah. It's kind of hazy, right? Not the most exciting. So what the researchers did is we can, we can zoom in and we can sort of look at what the paper surface looks like. So all these little white things you see here, those are paper fibers. And then you can see that there's little pigment grains on the surface. And so what the scientists did is that they, you know, we took small little pigment grains. So each one of these kind of reddish purplish colors are actually like individual pigment particles. And what we can do is we can apply silver nanoparticles directly on the surface of these pigment grains. And then we're gonna shine a laser at it. Again, it's the most fun part really. And so what that does is it turns up the volume on that molecule fingerprint so that we can figure out you know, what the colors that the artist used in order to actually originally make this scene. So again, this really isn't that much material. That's all you got. You have a few little particles. You can barely see them with your eyes. So let's shine a laser at it. Let's see what happens. So what you're gonna get is you're gonna get something that looks like this. I know, don't worry about trying to read it. Essentially what each one of these lines are, are different types of fingerprints. So you have a fingerprint that you could you know, put on the surface of a piece of glass or something. This is a molecule fingerprint that we get when we shine a laser at the nanoparticle mixed with the molecules. So here's our, one of our pigment grains, so like pigment grain A, and then we have some like standard materials. Like I know what these are already, you know, say like I was looking at a fingerprint of an unknown thing and I had a bunch of known fingerprints. I would then try to go ahead and do matches to figure out which one, you know, or ones it actually agrees with. And so it turns out that this pigment grain, you know, you can tell was like a very specific reddish material, um, which you probably wouldn't have guessed that the artist had used like purples and reds in the sunset based off of its current appearance. And so based off of this information, what the, the scientists and the, the art, you know, the art researchers that they were working with were able to figure out is, oh, this, you know, these probably faded because of the light exposure over time. So what it probably looks like when it was first made was something more like this. And so, you know, if you think about sort of like a really bold sunset scene, thinking about it more like this, like these really deep oranges, uh, sort of reds, purplish, orange color, this is sort of what I would imagine. And so we can use nanoscience to help us figure out, look at really, really small amounts of material to then sort of get an idea of like what something looked like when it was first. Again, it's really, it's really quite, quite a lot of a difference in this, you know, you can, the way that I would interpret the artwork would be very different if I had this sort of, you know, neutral, like looking background versus like this really bold sunset color. Another example is uh, this, this impressionist painting here. So this was by the artist Renoir. So this is Madame Leon Clapisson, that's the, the woman who is in the painting. And so, you know, the, the, the people who take care of the art, the conservators took it out from the frame. And what they realized was that the painting that was actually hiding underneath the frame was very, very like beautiful, deep red. But you can see here that the red tones in the background have faded very significantly as, as a result of just being exposed to the sunlight. And so again, the scientists got permission to actually take tiny little micro samples. So these are very small samples of the paint. So you can see here, this is sort of like a, let's call it cross section. So we're seeing the top layer here and then the bottom layer. So we see this like very bold red color. And then we could go ahead and we can use our nanoparticles, do some nanoscience, do some nano research in order to get that, those molecule, all those different molecule fingerprints. So these are two different samples from the painting. So we have like a faded area and a less faded area. And it turns out that we were able to figure out, you know, match it with reference materials 
and actually figure out what materials were used are. And so again, we can go ahead and we can use all of this new like digital technology we have to start to reimagine like, okay, what did the painting probably look like when it was first made before, you know, light and sun exposure and all that stuff began to start to have everything fade. And so they did a, an, a, another digital reconstruction based off of this molecular fingerprinting data. And again, it's such a, it's such a dramatic transformation, right? Like the painting is just totally different when you have this like beautiful red background as opposed to sort of like gray and blue and yellow. It's really much more striking, I think. So this just is sort of to give you an idea of, you know, how we can actually use nanoscience, not only to see how art used to be made, but actually use nanoscience in service of better understanding different types of art materials as they are now. Yeah, it definitely, there's a comment. It makes the painting more, more vibrant than the duller, lighter colors. I absolutely agree. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so that's it for my talk today. Um, I hope that you've sort of expanded your understanding of what a nano means. Uh, the fact that we've actually been doing nanoscience for like a thousand years already and how we can actually use nanoscience now to have better understanding of art materials. And now I'd be more than happy to take any of your questions. So you can go ahead and type them in the chat or you can unmute yourself whatever. But thank you so much for having me. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed this presentation. Let me know if anybody's typing because I am. Um... Uh, I, let's see. Maybe. Okay. I got it. Oh, this is a fun question. Did you ever continue with your cartoons? Do you continue drawing? And what's your favorite thing to draw? I don't draw as much as I, I would like to anymore, but um, during, you know, during the, the COVID time, my friend and I were doing like figure drawing online, which was really fun. Uh, I actually really like drawing food. Um, <laughs> so I like drawing cartoons of like little snacks that I'll eat or something like that. And then I like color them in with watercolors. So that's what I've been working on recently. I also sometimes will draw my dog, <laughs> things like that. Yeah, it's super fun. I'll take any questions about being a scientist in a museum, drawing, I have anything one. like that. Oh yeah, sure. Sure, I have one. Um, what's the most famous painting that you worked on? And um, yeah, okay. Was there any new discoveries um, based on the use of nanoscience? Yeah, sure. So I, well, a lot of work that I did, I think I talked about it last time, is I worked on a lot of Japanese pl prints. Uh, so if I go back, let's see, I think I can, one second. So we, yeah, so I worked on, so these Japanese prints, again, maybe some of you had seen them before, these are very, I think this is very famous. Uh, so it turns out that these are actually, uh, they were reproduced a lot. So these were sort of like fancy souvenirs that you would buy when you travel. Um, and so we use these like this nanoscience molecular fingerprinting technique to actually learn about the organic uh, pigments that were used on these. Um, and we were actually able to better sort of identify the date when they were actually produced uh, because that's not actually super well known because they were just produced so much that people don't actually know exactly when they were made. Um, so I would say probably the most famous thing that I've worked on directly is like is this wave print now. Let's see, I did have one more question about drawing that what is my favorite medium to use? Uh, I like working in pencil, drawing in pencil is fun, um, but I, I just like drawing with pens, just like very simple pens and then like doing some watercolor on top of that. So yeah, that's, I think that's my favorite. We got a question about whether they, they leave now. 
Yeah, I wrote her. I told her she can list oh, okay. Okay. questions. Yeah. Okay. I actually, I, I see a lot of students from, a, I think it's a, a Catholic, is it a Catholic school girls? Somebody be the representative? And I know that probably has a lot to do with Joan. The She's on the board. So oh, great. I know she invited a bunch of young ladies and I'm so- Oh, happy. fantastic. Well, we're, we're so happy to have you. Um, yeah. And if you, if you think of any other questions, I know me, I'll like, something will end. And then like 10 minutes later, I'm like, oh, I had like five questions. Yeah. Feel free to share, feel free to share my contact information or email your teacher questions. Um, and then they can send them to me and then I will answer them for you. So if you forget that you had a question and you really want it to be answered, please feel free to, you know, go ahead and message your teacher about it. <laughs> All right, let's see. Yes. Which All right, so I got a question. Mm -hmm. Which project was your favorite to work on? Mm, that's a good question. I don't know. I just, I really enjoy all of them. <laughs> One of the fun things about working like in an art museum type environment is that you're not just working with scientists, like you're working with the conservators who are the people that actually do the, take care of the art, like do the treatments. And then you also get to work with the people who like think about the art history. And so like every object has a history, you know, there are lots of people that have expertise in this, these things. So you get to like learn lots of different things from lots of different people. And then I get to teach them chemistry, which is always really exciting for me. Um, yeah, but I think, I mean, the Japanese prints probably were my favorite so far, uh, if, I, if I had to pick. <laughs> All right, let's see. I got a question about recommending uh, like colleges or places like universities, schools for people who would wanna become an artist or something similar. So I think it depends, um, you know, there are a lot of really good art schools all over the country. Um, so I think it depends on like what type of art you wanna do. Uh, I think it depends on like where you want to be. So like, do you want to live in New York? Do you want to live in California? You know, do you want to live in Chicago? Where do you want to go? Where do you want to be? Um, and I think that that can inform your decision. So, but if you, you know, if you want to sort of, you know, explore lots of general areas, I would recommend going to, you know, just like a, a larger school that has an art program, but you could also major or like study chemistry. You could study history. Uh, and you could also do art. Um, so yeah, so look at look around. Uh, I, th I think a good place to start would be where do you want to live? Where do you want to be? Um, and then you can take your search from there. Any more questions for Dr. Z? Yeah, let's see. We got one more question in the okay. chat. We got which which part of the project is your favorite to work on? Is it lasers? Is it looking through the microscope at the nanoparticles, collecting the data, et cetera? So that's a good question. I mean, I like all of it, right? Sometimes, you know, staring at your data and trying to figure out what it's telling you can be very challenging. <laughs> You're just like, what does this mean? It's like a puzzle. But figuring out the puzzle is super exciting. You're like, oh, I actually have something. This is so cool. And like talking to people about it and trying to figure out what what you actually have but honestly my favorite part is just being like working in the lab working with my hands um again you know i wanted I, I do a lot of you know kind of arts and crafts in my free time and so like i just love working with my hands so like i love being in the lab i love the whole process of just like you know working with my hands and like getting the data and just like working with the objects um it's really just so enjoyable to me um, and then also trying to, you know, solve the puzzle of what your research is trying to tell you is also very exciting. It's slow sometimes, to be completely honest, you know, sometimes you're like, I have no idea what this is. <laughs> but when you figure it out and you kind of finally unlock that puzzle, it's very exciting. All right, I think I'm going to stop sharing my screen.